Can't you see we're all just the same? That's why we need one another. You and I come together. We need one another right now. We need one another. Take my hand. When what I know, tell me what you know. Everything God made is beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. is present in your life today. I pray that his blessings be upon you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. I am Dr. Patricia Alzheimer, PhD in theology, and I must first give honor to God, who is the great creator and keeper of, a, of my soul. I also like to thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me counting me faith, putting me into the ministry. Thank you, Lord. My message today is entitled, How to be used in God's kingdom. How to be used in God's kingdom. The song say, you must have that fiery Holy Ghost. He said, the song say, that's moving and burning and keeping the prayer wheel turning. You ain't got to have it. The song say, you must be. Don't you see? You got to be born again. The first step to being used in God's kingdom, you, you got to be. Don't you see? You must be born again. My message again is entitled, How to Be Used in God's Kingdom. Number one still, as the song says, you must be. Don't you see? You got to be born again. Must have that fiery Holy Ghost that's moving and burning. Keeping the prayer wheel turning. The kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move. It makes you shout. Hallelujah, glory to God. It makes you cry when it's real. Never mind my voice, y'all, and how it sounds. What I'm saying, I, I, that, ain't what, that ain't my purpose here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's not my purpose. The same beautiful for you. Come on again. 
in it. That's the first step. You must have that fire and Holy Ghost that's moving and burning, that's keeping the prayer wheel turning. Hallelujah. The kind of religion you cannot conceal. Hallelujah. Making you move. Make you shout. Hallelujah. Make you cry when it's real. Hallelujah. 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 The prophet says it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. How to be used in God's kingdom. You must be born again. You must have a clean heart, a renewed spirit, right spirit, and a clean heart. be used in God's kingdom. God has chosen 1 Samuel chapter 9 and 10 as my foundational scriptures here. Get your Bibles and follow along if you can and if you will. Let me begin by giving you an overview of 1 Samuel 9 and and the first part of 1 Samuel 10. Uh, in this chapter, God, he appoints Saul as king over his people. He wanted to save them out of the hands of the Philistines. And when Saul was informed of this by Samuel, who was the seer, he didn't, he didn't feel that he was worthy to even uh, be placed in that position. And I guess he knew, uh, at least he thought he knew more about himself than God did. And as we look further into this story, we'll see that before Saul was even chose king, before he was chosen by God as king, he had made a conscious effort to just please the people rather than to please and serve God. But notice now. Even with that being the case, uh, Saul was still God's choice. Saul was still God's choice. And 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it reminds us that God judges our heart. And just when we think we are not worthy to be used in his kingdom, that's when God can use us most because we are most humble. We had our most humble estate. For well, just when we think that we can't be used in his kingdom. Hallelujah. Isaiah 55 and 8. He says, God says, my thoughts are not uh, your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. See, we don't think like God. We, we, we think of all kinds of things. Other than what God. Because our thoughts are not like God's thoughts. He said, if my thoughts are high, as high as the heavens above, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord God. You see, God knows best. And again, we don't know why God chooses whom he chooses for his, his kingdom work. And more times than not, we tend to look at the ones that he chooses and wonder, why did God choose them? Because if it was up to us, we, we wouldn't have appointed. We would have appointed somebody else if we didn't appoint our own selves. And we didn't feel our, that our, our uh, lives was up to par. Or our heart was up to par. We'll choose somebody. We'll have somebody else for that choosing. We 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 don't see why God chose those people. Now, if we look carefully, we'll see that Saul had been called by God. And basically, God knew that he could handle the task that he was about to assign him to. God knew. See, again, we, we walk through life and we, you know, everything that 
comes our way, it just passes right on by. Like cars on the expressway just passing us on by because we think, oh, we can't handle that. Oh, that, that's not for me. Or that's not my field. Or that's not for me. Or that's too much. I don't think, I don't think I can. God say, those he called, he foreknew, he predestined. He called them. He knew more about Saul than he knew about his own self. Remember now, he had a great task before him. He was called to prophesy and to be used by the Spirit of God to deliver Israel out of the Philistine, hands of the Philistine. But unfortunately, Saul did fail, tragically, just as many of us of God's people today. That, you know, we easily inherit or, or you know, we call by God to uh, do things. And, and we are uh, placed over certain uh, seats, positions, and, and opportunities. And people of God today, they sometimes eventually fall away because they allow Satan to deceive them into doing the opposite of what God called them to do. And for whatever reason that they lose these privileges, allow Satan to cause them to lose these privileges, devastating to them as well as it was with Saul because they never thought that it, it would happen to them. They, they never thought of it. But this shows us that even if our heart is not like uh, we think it should be or maybe even if God, you know, we thought maybe God wouldn't accept us in the way that we uh, appear to be to ourselves does not stop God from using us when he wants to because he knows the beginning and the ending of all things whatever work that work that he started in you he said he will finish it and God knows that our hearts must be uh, right, godly and he's the only one who can change our hearts but we can't change it ourselves so that we may be used for his benefit in the kingdom. And just like he changed Saul's heart so that he could be used to lead his people, Israel. He changed Saul's heart. He had him anointed, gave him a new heart. So that he'll be able to, to follow his lead. Let's read. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Samuel 10 and 9 through 11. First, uh, that uh, we're gonna read that right quick. First Samuel ten. Let's go to First Samuel ten, verse nine. Uh, this talks about uh, uh, that how we do have to have a, a godly heart. In the ninth verse of First Samuel ten, it says, "And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart." And all those signs came to pass that day. The tenth verse. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. The eleventh verse says, And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is coming to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Again, my subject is entitled, How to be used in the kingdom of God. How to be used. Let's look at a couple of Saul's characteristics because being that he was God's choice to become king, it must have been something that God saw in him that he didn't see. Father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. The fourth verse. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, 
and there they were not. And he passed through the land of Benjamites, but they found them not. In the fifth verse. And when they were come to the land of Zeph, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave, caring for the asses, and take thought for us. If we notice here, Saul appeared to be a man who is not just a hearer of the Mosaic law, but also a doer. Now, we're talking about characteristics. He, was, he wasn't just a hearer. He was a doer. And here, uh, he uh, seemed to be abiding by Exodus 20 and 12. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 20 and 12. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now Saul knew that his father's donkeys were lost. So he not only set out to locate them, but he also respected his father and knew that he would be concerned about him if he were gone too long. You know, just like fathers, mothers, or whatsoever, guardians, uh, uh, become concerned in this day and age if the child or person of interest is gone too long during the day. So this verse tells us that uh, he was a caring person. So that was another characteristic. He was a, ca a caring person who made a conscious effort to obey the law and he respected the feelings of others. He was caring. The next characteristic of Saul we notice is that he knew how to honor the things of God and, and, and regard, he regarded them as being profound and not just ordinary. He also really wanted, he really wanted to locate his father's donkeys. You know how you want to do something for somebody and you, you want to do it and uh, 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 you get it done. You won't stop until to, you, your, your heart's not satisfied until you get it done. He, wore, he really wanted to locate those donkeys, and he knew that he needed to go to the man of God for help because he just couldn't find them. But he didn't feel right to go there without taking him a gift. He, he knew that the man of God, who was the seer, would be the one that could help him. He, he, he respected that. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel. We're going to read verse 7 through 10. Well, we'll start at the 6th verse to lead to the 10th verse. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he said cometh surely to pass. Pay attention. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. He said, all that he says come to pass. We're talking about a prophet, a seer. Think about that as you talk about getting a prophet to tell, allowing a prophet to tell you something in this day and age. It must surely come to pass. This, the seventh verse says, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels. And there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? The eighth verse says, And the servant answered. He answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here a hand. I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give to the man of God. To tell us our way. The eighth verse, the ninth verse. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Tenth verse. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, Come let us go. 
So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And if you notice here, notice the gift of silver that the servant had to give uh, to the man of God. It was pleasant. It was a pleasing uh, gesture to Saul. Because back then, that was um, uh, an, uh, uh, an appropriate gift for God uh, uh, from those who realized that uh, their, their faults and, their, and the fact that they totally depended upon God for everything, uh, especially being delivered from sin. That was an appropriate gift. Silver, gift of silver. Now remember, he also possessed meekness and humbleness as his characteristics. Let's read First Samuel nine eighteen through twenty one. The eighteenth, we're gonna start at the eighteenth, and we go to the twenty first verse. And we'll we'll look at his his, his uh, meekness and humbleness. Eighteenth uh, verse, First Samuel chapter nine. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. The 19th verse. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today and tomorrow I will let thee go. 20th verse. Continuing from the 19th. I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee? And on all thy father's house. The 21st verse. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speaketh thou so to me? Again, he was so humble that when he, when he was told that he was chosen by God to be king, he began pouring out all kinds of things that about himself that he thought would, would make him unworthy. That's how we do. We, we belittle our own self. When God just sitting back shaking his head waiting for us to acknowledge him. He said, trust in him. And acknowledge him in all your ways, everything. And he will direct our path. And we can start doing that a lot more. We'll be, be, be able to be used in the kingdom a lot quicker. And a lot more. Uh, than normal. But since God looks on our heart, as 1 Samuel 16 and 7 says, it's obvious that the things that Saul thought should have made him unworthy to be appointed as king wasn't viewed as such by God. Let's look at uh, another uh, characteristic uh, hereby that was um, shown in Saul. You see, uh, we, we see his willingness and obedience to be used by God after Samuel had given him uh, God's instructions for his future as king. Now, if we notice that um, uh, first Samuel, let's go to 1 Samuel 9, 19. If we, if we notice in 1 Samuel 9, 19, the first recognizable gesture Samuel did was to extend to Saul an invitation to break bread with him. An invitation. The 19th verse of chapter 9 of 1 Samuel said, And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and I will tell thee all that is in thine heart. Recognizable gesture. The first recognizable gesture was he was kind. He, he invited, he gave me an invitation to break bread fellowship with him. But Samuel said, today we will fellowship and tomorrow I will let you uh, uh, go. He also informed Saul that while, 
while fellowshipping with him that he would share the things he had on his heart from God to tell him why God's why he was there, why what, what, what made him come there, uh, what he wanted, what God wanted him to know. Now Samuel knew Saul had a concern, and you look at First Samuel nine twenty, but he assured Saul that uh, there was no need to be concerned about the donkeys. Let's read that. 1 Samuel 9, 20. 1 Samuel 9, verse 20. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them. For they are found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel. Is it not on thee, and on all thy father's house? He assured Saul that there was no need to be concerned about the donkeys, because they had been found. And that he wanted him to clear his mind of that concern. Besides, he said, a few donkeys lost. He said, you're about to inherit much, much more. Excuse me. <clears throat> and Samuel wanted Saul to have a clear mind to be able to break bread and fellowship with, uh, peacefully without a care on his mind, on his heart. And Samuel knew that he had more important business that God wanted uh, him to share with Saul. He, he, he didn't come there to, uh, to sit and listen to him talk about he, he was uh, needing to find his lost do uh, donkeys. He wanted, to, wanted him to have a peaceful mind. And uh, this message that God is sending us today, his children, Yes, in 1 Peter 5, 7, he says he wants us to cast all our care upon him. Because he cares for us enough to not want us to be worried all the time about something that we can have no control over. So that when we come into his presence, we can, can uh, fellowship with him. We, can, we have a clear mind so that we can be used in his kingdom uh, without burdens and problems that's weighing us down. God also wants our hearts to be burden free uh, because he, he just, he, he, that's what he's there for. Let's read uh, Psalms 46 and 1. Psalms. It's like an armor, uh, the armor bearer carries the load. Well, God is, uh, is our armor bearer. And just like uh, you see the golf cat, the Golfers have their guys that carry everything for them. God carries our loads just like that, even more, more so. Even more so. All we have to do is take our burden to him, cast our care upon him, for he cares for us. We're going to read Psalms 46 and 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Remember now, God wants us to trust in him that he'll be our help in times of trouble. So we can be burden free. Uh, like uh, Samuel wanted Saul to be. Let's read what happens next after the fellowship. Let's go to 1 Samuel 9, 26 and 27. The 26th verse says, And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them. He and Samuel abroad. And the fellowship was over, and as they left off, uh, on their way, it, it states that in, in the scripture, that as Saul was leaving the city, uh, Samuel needed some private time with him. So, so uh, he, he asked Saul to allow the servants, say, allow your servants to go on ahead of us so, so we can talk. I can, I can show you the word of God in the 27th verse. 27th verse says, and as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. 
but stand thou still a while that I may show thee the word of God. He said, you let your service go on. He said, but you stay here for, just stand still for a minute so I can talk to you. I, I have a word from the Lord that I want to talk to you. It's, it's a special message just for you from God. And that's how it is with us, uh, God's people of today. You know, sometimes we have to let people go on ahead of us. I don't care what, in life. Sometimes we have to let people go on ahead of us, even though it may seem like we are not prospering like they might be, or we're not uh, up where they are, or, uh, or whatever the case might be. But God needs to spend private time with his children sometimes, and we have to know when to stand still. Like Samuel told Saul, to stand still and let your, let your service go on ahead. We have to know when to stand still and listen to God. Even though people, our friends, family, or whatever is moving on in all directions, that it even might appeal to us. They, those things that they're doing might appeal to us sometimes. But it might not be for us. We have to stand still and listen to God ourselves, for ourselves, our lives. Now let's let's go to um, 1 Samuel 10 and 1. 1 Samuel 10 and 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? At that time, when he poured it over his head, that uh, uh, the oil, when uh, Samuel... Uh, poured the oil over Saul's head and kissed him. At that time, right then, he informed him that uh, he was doing it because the Lord had appointed him to be captain over his inheritance. And you see, we must see God continually also for everything, especially his anointing. We, we, we need his anointing so that he will be able to use us, sending us wherever he wants us to go. We have to have his anointing. Remember in Isaiah 6 and 8, God asked Isaiah, he said, Whom shall I send and who will go for me? Who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. So we must stay uh, connected to the Lord in order to be uh, ready at all times to be sent and, be, and to be used in God's kingdom. My topic is how to be used in the kingdom of God, how to be used in God's kingdom. In order for us to get to know God's heart, God wants us to be godly children after his own heart like David was. And if you haven't read uh, about David, if you haven't already read about him, you, you need to read about him and learn how he became um, a man after God's own heart. If you want to read about David, read 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, and of course, some of the uh, books of Psalms, which was written by uh, David himself, I believe uh, at least the first 41 verses. First 41 chapters, I'm sorry. I believe David wrote the first 41 uh, chapters of Psalms, books of Psalms. Now, God uses David as an example of, of an ordinary person who, like us, had struggles in life, and especially during this, his uh, sheep herding years. He uses David to, uh, as an ordinary person to show that also, like David, we, we can also develop a personal relationship with him in order to make our life stress-free. And for those who know the life of David, you may recall he was, he was. He was just an ordinary person who sometimes didn't succeed at things that, that he attempted. Just like us, he became frustrated, unsure about uh, things in life, and oh yeah, he did sin, just like we do. Just like the human race, he was human. But David, like we the children of God, he made a, a choice to get close to God. He was a man after God's own heart. And he made that choice to get close to God by establishing a personal relationship with him. He used his relationship to the fullest. And that's what we have to do. We have to 
take it and use it at any cost for everything. He used his relationship to the fullest with God and regarded the Lord as his shepherd. Let's go to 23, Psalms 23. Psalms 23. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. The first verse says, I shall not want. The Lord is his shepherd. He said, I shall not want. The second verse, he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He, this is his shepherd doing all of those things, you know, like a shepherd would do a sheep. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Just like a shepherd do a sheep with his rod and staff. David said his shepherd was the Lord and he was taking care of him in the same manner. The Lord was his shepherd, he said. And you see, I believe that because David was a shepherd over sheep himself and knew what it took to be a good shepherd, that made him know that God, hey, yes he did, God took better care of him than he could ever take care of a sheep. Hallelujah. Did God do? He take care, better care of me than I could ever take care of anything and anybody. Jesus. And so David, he regarded that. He regarded that, that God as his shepherd. And he regarded the fact that God had everything that he could ever need. And that's how sheep are supposed to be. They're supposed to be dependent upon their shepherd for everything, to take care of them in every way that they need taken care of. God is the good shepherd. Jesus, I'm the good shepherd. And as I close this message, I want you to know that God wants us, wants to have a personal relationship with us, all of us, each and every one of us. We can't, as my mother said, go in on the coattail of somebody else. We have to go, go to God on our own. We have to have a personal relationship with him on our own. So that we'll know on a daily basis what he has in, in store for us. What he has on his heart for us. Like Samuel uh, had on his heart to deliver to Saul from God. God can show us what's on his heart. We don't have to have somebody else to come and tell us the Lord Jesus is right there for us. Unlikely when we when when he sent Samuel to inform Saul of his assignment from God, we we you know we gotta remember we we as a people of God, we are his children. And once we become, you know, uh, once we uh, sustain, sustain that personal relationship with him, he said, then because you do as I say do, and I share the things of God with you. You're no longer servants. You're my friends. So once we become uh, God's friends, you can hear from him yourself regarding his assignments in, in your lives. We must keep a personal relationship with him. That's all it, it takes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.9. 1 Corinthians The ninth verse says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Eyes have not seen, 
nor ear heard. That's what it says. We have not a clue what God has in store for his children unless you become one. The things of God is not, it's not for the ones that's not his children. It's prepared for them, he said, in the ninth verse of 1 Corinthians 2. He says, prepare for them that love him. How do you know you love him? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So again, we must seek a personal relationship with him in order to be used in the kingdom of God. Along with everything else that I mentioned, you must have a personal relationship to be used in the kingdom. And to know how he wants to use you in the kingdom. Let's, let's go to Matthew 6.31. Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. I'm going to read the 31st verse, flow down to the 33rd verse. Matthew chapter 6. 31st verse says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. The 33rd verse says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Again, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Get a relationship, a personal relationship. That's what God's message is here for the people of God today. We got to simply look at the Lord, look for the Lord for everything. We, we got to get a personal relationship, which again is required. Seeking him, seeking his face. Just like you have personal relationships down here in, on earth, we got to have a personal relationship uh, with God, with the Lord. We can't just go to somebody, anybody, and say, you know what, I need your help for such and such. You don't even know who they are. You don't know their ways. You don't know what they require of you or uh, uh, or, or whatever. That's why you got to have a personal relationship in, in all cases with anybody, anything, for whatever reason. The same goes for the Lord. We have to have a personal relationship. In order to get, uh, as they say, reap the benefits of what he has in store for us and have prepared for those who love him. Let's go to John 14. John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 5 and 6. The, the fifth verse says, Thomas said unto to him, Lord, we know now whither thou goest. How can we know the way? The sixth verse says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so as my mother, uh, grandmother would say, seems as though it makes a whole heap of a lot of sense to have a personal relationship with the Lord. It does. Isn't it strange that even as a people of God, we tend to we tend to want to have a personal relationship with everything and everybody but God. We think we can read a few scriptures and go on. That ain't gonna get it. You put a few drops of gas in your gas tank, you won't you won't get far. You won't get far. We gotta meditate on his word day and night. We gotta pray. We gotta constantly seek his face in order to be used in the kingdom of God. My uh, topic is how to be used in the kingdom of God. We got to do, we got to, we got to keep doing it. Doctors, we want, we want a personal relationship with, with everything and everybody but God. We want a personal relationship with doctors, neighbors, and co-workers, and lawyers, and dentists, and friends, and family. And let's not forget that almighty dollar, which the Lord said in 1 Timothy uh, 6 and 10, that the love of that almighty dollar is the root of all evil. And the reason I say even we as the people of God 
I tend to have a person, want to have a personal relationship with everything and everybody but God, is because we already know that the world does that. But even in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God continued to rebuke his own people who were called by his name, but wasn't humble, wasn't praying, wasn't seeking his faith, and was still in wickedness. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 7, 14 right quick. 2 Chronicles 2 Chronicles 7, the 14th verse says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God talks to his people first. God talks to me before I can even give uh, a, a, a message. I can't even talk on the message without him talking to me too. I'm, I'm right there in the number. I'm, I'm before I even give it to you. He's knocking on my door. He said, my people. He didn't say the world. He know the world is out there doing that. He said, but they're my people who are called by my name. And some of the people of God today is still viewed by him as his people being called by his name, not humble, not praying, not seeking his faith, and still in wickedness, with no personal relationship at all. My mom would say at all. No personal relationship at all. Let's read Acts 17, 24 through 28. Acts 17 chapter. The 24th verse. We'll start there. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of the heaven and the earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The 25th verse says, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. The 26th verse says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. 27th verse that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The 28th verse says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Jesus reminds us, he reminds us that it's in him that we live, we move, and have our being. If we're going to live, we might as well live a godly life. Since we got to move, and then we might as well have a, hum a humble spirit. That we got to have a, a, our being in him. Why not be a spiritual being? Again, we need to have a personal relationship with the Lord in order to be used in the kingdom of God. But did you not know that some people think that they are controlling their own life? I, I, I beg to differ. I beg, I beg to differ. Second Corinthians 3 and 5, Paul tells us that not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. First Corinthians 15 and 10 says that it's only by the grace of God that we are what we are. John 15, 1 through 6, uh, uh, Jesus tells us that uh, he's the vine, implying that there is a, a, a false vine. He's the true vine. And we, we, his children, are the branches. 
and that we must abide in him and let his word abide in us in order to ask whatever it is that we want. He said, but without him, we can do nothing. Just like a branch cut off of a tree can't survive, can't live, we can't do nothing without Jesus. It's just like children. Our children, when they are small, you know, we will want them to abide in what we ask them to do. Follow our rules and regulations in order to receive some of the things that they want. But if they don't obey, you think, oh, how many of you want to give them what they ask for? You're not going to be happy to give them anything. That's how God is. He wants us to abide in him and let his word abide in us. So whatever it is that we need or want, we can ask him. Without, uh, without the parents, the children can't do anything. And Jesus said without him, we as his children can't do anything. We might do it on our own without his permission, but most times, either it don't work or it won't last. Let's read what Proverbs 16.25 says. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Again, we might do some things on our own, but it ain't what God said, and it won't last. And as I close, I want to inform you that you will know that you have established a relationship with God and are ready to be used in the kingdom when you are saved, you're sanctified, and filled with God's Holy Spirit. When you have the love of God shed abroad in your heart. When you enjoy glorifying him on a daily basis. When you seek his face daily. When you continually seek his wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. When righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost becomes part of your daily walk with God. When, when, when you realize that you, you are not ashamed of his gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's a few attributes of God, uh, having a relationship with God. When you seek God for a godly life and seek to, to, to have it more abundantly, when you know firsthand that his, his grace is sufficient for you, you know, you're on your, you, you know you've established a personal relationship. When you allow his spirit to lead you. Now these are just a few attributes to, to let you know that you have a personal relationship with God. But, but there is plenty more. And during these times, God's spirit will confirm with your spirit. He is wonderfully pleased about how we are seeking to do always those things which pleases him. Well, God's people, my time is up for this session. And, I remember, and remember, my sermons can also be viewed on Ustream under the title, It's in the Book. And to the unsaved, God is waiting for you with outstretched arms. Won't you accept Jesus as your personal Savior today? Until next time, remember, the things which seem impossible with man is possible with God. I am Dr. Patricia Altimer. Be blessed. Thank you, Jesus. You must have. Fiery Holy Ghost that's moving, burning, that keeps the prayer will turning, that kind of religion you cannot conceal and makes you move. Tell me what you know. Everything God made is beautiful. We are, and I'll be there whenever near or far. People, we need one another. You and I come together. We need one another right now. We need one another. Take our hands from whatever we need one another right now.